Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to join this workshop. So I will talk about the cosmic microwave background, which I call subtitle uh, the cosmological success story. And you will see why. Uh, we'll first give an introduction to the cosmic microwave background, then briefly talk about the thermal history of the universe, and about and then about CMB fluctuations, I will come as far as the initial conditions to Anna's talk. And then I will talk about what we can learn from the cosmic microwave background. As you probably all know, the, uh, the microwave background have been, has been observed by, uh, di uh, discovered by Penzias and Wilson accidentally in 1964, they actually were testing um, radio antennas uh, for transmission for TV stations and discovered a, ba uh, a isotropic background which they couldn't get rid of and which was higher than uh, the limiting sensitivity of the telescope, which you see here in the background. I always find this really an amazing telescope. It's now actually exhibited. You can all go and look at it. It was at that time, 1964, the best instrument ever because not far away in New Jersey, physicists were also searching for this microwave background, but they couldn't find it. They didn't have as sensitive antennas as the people from um, uh, uh, from the private sector. Uh, the, co the existence of the cosmic microwave background has already been predicted around in, in the 40s by Gamow together with Alpha and Hermann. And uh, Gamow actually has said if the universe is really expanding, and then in the past it was much denser and hotter, and therefore there was a time when uh, everything was ionized and photons were in thermal equilibrium with the baryons and all the matter in the universe, and there should be relic radiation from this, pro from this time, and it should be of the order of, I think he predicted something like five Kelvin or so for the temperature it should have now. This is the spectrum as it has been measured now. Here you see data from uh, 1991. That's the most recent data we have on this spectrum. Unfortunately, one would have to launch a new satellite and nobody wants to pay for it because everybody's scared it might not give us much surprise because this is actually the most precise ever measured back, uh, black body at this temperature. And this is the temperature. I mean, for us cosmologists, this is amazing. We have a number which we know to three or four digits. And deviations are limited. There have no deviations been seen. For example, chemical uh, potential must be less than nine times 10 to the minus five. The so-called Compton Y parameter should be less than 10 to the minus five, roughly. Compton Y parameter is the following. If you have uh, thermal radiation at the low temperature and it passes through hot electrons, then it scatters of these electrons and the low, uh, the low energy photons will get uh, uh, higher energy, and you can describe this with a shift in the spectrum, which is parameterized by some dimensionless parameter, which, I co which is called the Compton Y parameter. Or there could be a contribution from free free emission, which is also limited to less than about 10 to the minus 5. We also know, for example, this uh, process, Compton Y parameter, has been observed in many places because if you have a cluster, in a cluster you have electron gas at uh, 100 keV or something like that, temp keV temperature tends to 50 keV temperature, which is much hotter than the CMB. And there, for in, uh, uh, 
uh, in front of clusters, this Compton Y parameter has locally been observed and has routinely been used, for example, to detect clusters with Planck. But a global overall Compton Y parameter, one can calculate what its value should be roughly. It's between 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 8, depends a little bit on your models for structure formation. So one would have to go about two orders of magnitude better to see it. Also a chemical potential. There should actually be a chemical potential. And that chemical potential would come from silk damping. E on small scales, uh, the process of recombination, which we will discuss in a moment, actually leads to damping of fluctuations. And this damping of fluctuations feeds into the spectrum and should generate the chemical potential, which you can calculate, and should be about 10 to the minus 7. Again, one would have to go two orders of magnitude lower to have a guaranteed signal. This signal would help us a lot to determine <coughs> Uh, small-scale fluctuations. And if our idea of inflation is correct uh, and goes to very, very small scales, then we can calculate what there is and we get this 10 to the minus 7. If the number which we would detect would be different, that would be very interesting and constrain inflation. So we could learn a lot if we could have a satellite to measure this spectrum better by two orders of magnitude. This cannot be done on Earth because you need a large frequency coverage and extremely precise measurements. Actually, the limitation of these measurements here <coughs> were the limitations of the reference black body aboard the COBE satellite. These data points here the really relevant one are from the virus instrument aboard the COBE satellite, which flew in uh, 1990. Now, let me briefly talk about the history of the universe. The universe is expanding. That has been observed already in the 20s. And if one extrapolates this expansion back into the past, one finds that there was a singularity of infinite curvature and infinite density about uh, 10 to the 10 years ago. Of course, we know that uh, somewhere this extrapolation must break down, and it just means that our physical theory doesn't go this far back. We call this the Big Bang, and we call T0 the age of the universe. The expansion is adiabatic, so in the, in the past, this, the universe was not only much denser, it was also much hotter. And at the uh, at, uh, ten, uh, time, T recombination, so uh, when the universe was about 10 to the 5 years old, so you see a very small fraction of its present age. Hydrogen, the most abundant, uni abundant univer uh, element in the universe, was ionized. And baryons and photons interacted and were in thermal equilibrium. And the reason it was ionized was that there were just too many photons which had energies above 13.6 electron volt to keep it, uh, uh, to let it recombine. Uh, after that time, there were no long, the hydrogen didn't remain ionized. The density was hot enough, uh, was high enough so that uh, electrons and protons would find each other and would recombine to neutral hydrogen. This is called the moment of recombination, even though there was no other combination before. So in that case, contrary to reionization, it's actually the wrong term. But once established, it's difficult to change the wrong term. After this moment of recombination, which should rather be called combination, photons became virtually collisionless. There were, was a very small uh, fraction of still ionized electrons around, about 10 to the minus 5 of all the electrons were still ionized, not sufficiently to have each photon uh, interact with them. Most photons just moved freely along geodesics into our antennas. <coughs> uh, 
when recombination happened, the temperature of the CMB of, this of the, the thermal radiation was about 0.3 electron volt. So you might ask why not 13.6 electron volt? <coughs> <coughs> That is actually an exam question which I usually ask in a cosmology exam. And the reason for that is that there are about 10 to the 10 times as many photons in the universe as there are protons. So even at this temperature, there are still sufficiently many photons with energies above the reionization energy of hydrogen to keep the universe ionized. So recombination or decoupling of photons, and uh, recombination is a little bit earlier, and then decoupling happens when the mean free part of the photons becomes larger than uh, the Hubble radius. There are also other thermal events in the universe which happened before recombination, which I shall briefly mention. For example, at the about 0.1, MEV, nucleosynthesis happens. This is when deuterium becomes stable at higher temperature. Deuterium is broken apart all the time by high energy photons, but then it becomes stable and that, at that moment, more or less, all the neutrons still present in the universe form helium-4. There are traces of de deuterium and tritium remaining and small traces of lithium-7. <coughs> but most of it gives you helium-4, and actually this nucleosynthesis process was also first estimated by Gamow, and he found that roughly a quarter of the matter in the universe should be in helium, which was unexplained before, because stars form maybe 1-2% of helium. Even at even higher temperature, about 100 MeV, probably there was confinement transition where uh, quarks and gluons form parions. There is no direct observational signature of this. Uh, or at 200 GeV, there was uh, the Higgs became massive, there was the electroweak transition or crossover, but also there we don't have probably any direct signature which we could pinpoint to this transition. And even earlier, probably, there was inflation, uh, about which we shall talk a little bit. <coughs> so this is a resume of everything. This is where galaxies and human beings have formed at higher temperature atoms are around um, at about 3,000 degrees. Uh, there was no neutral hydrogen at even higher temperature. There, there was nucleosynthesis, and here nucleons formed before we had a soup of quarks and gluons. And uh, even higher, all the particles were massive. And even earlier, at some point, there probably was some kind of inflation. And before that, we don't know. Now we want to concentrate mainly, this is the, I think, a bit the graphic which Anna also showed you. We want to concentrate on the, on the cosmic microwave background <coughs> and its fluctuations. Uh, cosmic microwave background, as we said, was, uh, became free about uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Then there was what we call the Dark Ages, the time when there were fluctuations, but not yet galaxies, not yet stars, no light to shine. And then the first stars formed and probably reionized the universe. We don't know exactly how and then the process of galaxy formation took place. And this epoch we, will, we are trying to observe via galaxies, this maybe we can see neutral hydrogen there, would also be a possibility to see neutral hydrogen before reionization, 
when all the, or most of the hydrogen should have been still neutral at redshifts of 20, 30 or so. But of course, that would be very, very large radio telescopes to see this. But there are plans to also look into these star cages via the 21 centimeter flip, which then is redshifted by a factor 20, 30, 40, depending on where you want to look. <coughs> Now, why are there fluctuations in the CMB? Why should there be? The reason is that the structure which we see in the universe, the galaxies, stars, the voids, the filaments, all what Anne was talking about, we assume that this formed by gravitational instability of small initial fluctuations. Gravity is the only kind of, Newtonian gravity is the only kind of unstable interaction which we are dealing with and which uh, is present <coughs> due to the fact if we look at gravity in a static universe, you will see that fluctuations grow exponentially beyond a certain gene scale. However, due to the expansion of the universe, this growth is very much slo slowed down, becomes only a power law. And actually, <coughs> Statistical fluctuations are by far not enough to generate the structures we see. You need initial fluctuations of the order of 10 to the minus 5. So we need a process which lays down initial fluctuations. We cannot just throw statistical fluctuations. And what can generate such initial fluctuation is, for example, a phase of inflation. During inflation, what happens, the expansion is very, very fast. So scales which were, uh, which, uh, which were super horizon come inside the Hubble horizon very, very rapidly. And you find that quantum fluctuations of the inflaton field are amplified by this time-dependent metric. Right? It's just amplification of, it's like particle production. If you have a very rapidly varying electric or electric field, you can generate electron positron par pairs. Here you have a very rapidly uh, changing metric and you generate inflaton modes, which are sufficiently low energy, which come into resonance during this expansion. <coughs> we actually also generate gravitational waves which are modes of the metric. You generate both. Um, once these in inflaton fluctuations are larger than the Hubble radius, they are no longer in causal contact, and you find that they freeze in as classical fluctuations in the metric and in the energy density of the inflaton during inflation. And after inflation, they are classical fluctuations in the matter density, usually relativistic particles, right, of the standard model. Uh, and therefore, they should be everywhere, also in the CMB. They should be in all of the energy density of the universe and therefore also in the CMB. <coughs> Actually, immediately after the discovery of the CMB, people have searched for this fluctuations. Even though there was no theory of inflation, of inflation at that time, they knew there must be initial fluctuations. It cannot be just statistical fluctuations, and therefore they should probably have been have formed before recombination and should also be present in the CMB. What people have found already in the 70s was a dipole, but this can be explained with our motion with respect to this reference frame. Uh, which is on the order of about 10 to the minus 3, so about 300 kilometers per second. However, in the 90s, people have found <coughs> also higher modes, not only the dipole. If you subtract the dipole, that is what is left over. That was the discovery of these fluctuations in 92. This was the second satellite in 2003, and these are the latest data from the Planck satellite of these fluctuations. These fluctuations are extremely useful. Of course, the uh, CMB fluctuations are a function on the sphere, so you can expand them in spherical harmonics, 
And here are the data points for this power spectrum of CLs, which is <coughs> assuming statistical homogeneity and isotropy, ALMs of different L and M should not be correlated, and we should obtain such a spectrum. The blue line is the calculation, and the red points are the data points. And this calculation is performed with nearly linear perturbation theory. The reason why the CMB is such successful data is that it is so simple. We can nearly explain it with linear perturbation theory. There is a little bit of nonlinearities in it, which if you want, I will also explain. But what you see, for example, is these peaks here, <coughs> which are really acoustic peaks in the sense that the radiation, uh, once inflation entered, ended, started to collapse and expand. So uh, gravity wants to make it collapse. Radiation pressure makes it expand. If there is only radiation, you actually find that these peaks all have the same amplitude. But because there are the baryons, there are two effects. First, baryons prefer gravitational collapse. So peak one and peak three, which are due to collapse, are higher than peak four and peak two. But then there is an overall damping due to diffusion of photons out of over and under densities when their mean free path grows during recombination. There is this kind of damping over envelope over the whole thing. So you, we can use these to determine cosmological parameters. Uh, this is just to show you that was the data some 20 years ago, around 2002. And this is, this is the data we have now, just to see that there was a really, really a lot of progress in this field during the last 20 years. Just to explain you one thing, maybe <coughs> I don't want to go into too much details, but of course the angular scale on which, the scale which collapsed once, which did one collapse, the angular scale on which it projects depends on the distance of this radiation. And this distance depends on the cosmological parameter on how much radiation matter, how much dark energy there is in the universe and how the dark energy evolves. So we can use this to ter determine a Hubble parameter, to determine all kinds of cosmological parameters. This is just one example, there are more. And actually, this is the list, the first part of the list of parameters which have been determined with an accuracy which you see is typically on the percent level. This is the spectral index of the initial power spectrum, its amplitude, the angle onto which exactly this scale has been projected, the baryon density of the universe, the cold dark matter density, and what you see especially also is that the matter density is about 0.14, here, this is in units. If this is one, this means it's the only co uh, contribution to the expansion of the universe. This parameter omega uses the, uh, the Friedman equations and relates the density of the universe to the expansion rate. So if that parameter is one, the sum of these omega parameters from matter, curvature, radiation, dark energy, etc., will always add up to one if Einstein's equation are valid. So here you see, if we take only matter, there is a lot missing. And here you see another plot. Here there is the matter content and the curvature, and there is some kind of degeneracy with what the Hubble parameter is. Here you see the value of the Hubble parameter. You cannot make it larger than about 70, but the best value is here. But if you take into account other data, baryon acoustic oscillations, you find it must be somewhere here. And the matter density is about 30%. The curvature is close to zero, if not zero, and the rest must be dark energy. There, I also want to just briefly address polarization, because this radiation is slightly polarized. I just quickly explain the physics of this polarization 
and then I state one more thing. So imagine here an electron, you have, let's say, more radiation coming in from above than from below. And outgoing radiation co coming from above can, of course, not be polarized in the direction of the photon, but must be polarized in this direction. I took here a right angle to make this cost square theta equal to zero. If it comes from this direction, it must be polarized like that. So if there is more radiation coming from here than from here, you end up with some net linear polarization. <coughs> so if you have slight anisotropy, this will generate you a slight polarization. And you can actually measure this polarization has been measured. Here is the correlation of the polarization with the temperature. And you see it fits very well also with the model, which have been, has been obtained using only the temperature fluctuations. <coughs> and here is the pure polarization spectrum. What is interesting in this polarization is that it comes in kind of two ways of, with, with, with two kind of uh, parities. There is so-called E-polarization, which is kind of a, a gradient field on the sphere, and there is B-polarization, which is a curl field on the sphere. If you have only scalar perturbations, you can only generate this E-polarization, and that has been observed. However, if we would have gravitational waves, you could also observe depolarization. And for this, so far, we have only upper limits, but that is kind of the goal of the future. If we ever want to see gravitational waves, we can constrain it with this depolarization. And gravitational waves would be interesting because they would allow us really to determine the energy scale of inflation which we now don't know. We don't know, we only know that it is limited to be less than about 1.5 times 10 to the 16 GeV. But that's not so much. That's like three orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. So if you want to know more about the CMB, I wrote a book about it. You can have a look. <laughs> I brought it. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of interesting news still coming from the CMB. I don't think it's over. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs> <coughs>